Welcome to the Harden Your Security Mindset webinar. Uh, I'm Tim Sarowitz, the Vice President of Education for the Linux Foundation, and I'm here with Glenn Tenkate. Glenn, tell us about yourself. Yes, uh, so I am now, I think, almost two decades into cybersecurity, officially. Uh, I actually started uh, when I was like 12 years old, uh, playing a lot of games, uh, and then I encountered first time some hackers, actually, in my favorite game, and uh, they built an aimbot, and that actually inspired me, like, wow, is this possible? How did they do that? Uh, yeah, and from there, actually, it took uh, quite a journey to, to be here uh, as a cybersecurity specialist. Um, worked in different areas, also in IT, so as a software developer, uh, as a penetration tester, hacker, uh, as a security engineer, and also as a yeah, security uh, solution architect, uh, building like, uh, you know, interesting solutions to very big uh, problems. And like, for example, the whole agile DevOps movement, how do you incorporate security in a fast space uh, like software development? Um, so tons of experience, and I'm very happy here today to share, I uh, hopefully, uh, a lot of that as much as possible with you. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, definitely, definitely a lot of experience. Um, cybersecurity and, and software security is, of course, you know, everywhere. It's everybody's job. I, I know the places I've been, a lot of times it's that easy button at the end. Now that we're done, let's click that little button and uh, now we're going to be secure. And I think time has shown that that's not the most effective way of going about it. But uh, tell us more, how, how do we change our mindset? How do we get into uh, really looking at those security risks for our web apps and trying to solve for them? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, what I notice is especially uh, also companies go through like a learning phase, right? So at first is the, you know, the awareness that they need to address security in their uh, organization and uh, when they develop stuff. Um, of course, the first step is that they, uh, well, buy a shiny tool and uh, with the promise that it is a silver bullet and will solve all their issues. And of course, it will help them in a certain aspect, right? And for a certain percentage. But actually, what you see is that, yeah, there's still a huge gap uh, left where you need to address uh, the, the, the residue of uh, what is left there. So what, what I notice is especially is that uh, good guidance in terms of uh, what is required when you build certain type of functionality in terms of security requirements. And what I also notice is, well, how do you interpret those security requirements? You do need to have some kind of security knowledge, right? And awareness. Um, so there you really see that, yeah, training people, doing hands-on labs, you know, really let them play with the code, you know, the offensive style of hacking. Yeah? So how does a hacker actually work? So they can more identify uh, also with our code and with our functionalities they're building on then how to actually do the offense part, right? The defending and, and making sure those vulnerabilities are not being introduced. And also, yeah, what it actually means, eh? certain security requirements and how do you actually implement them in the correct way? So in you know my belief, I think still with all the different type of technologies that are out there eh? and the tools and all the good stuff, it is still a people well, sort of solution, right? That is proper training, proper awareness, and a structural approach when you are building uh, applications and software. I think that is the crucial part, actually, to at least have a good chance to, you know, survive and and not be victim of a, an attack. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, there is that um, that wish to have a silver bullet. That it's a lot to, especially when you don't know it. That it's a lot to keep track of. Um, so, so avoiding the. Could you just solve this for me if I write a big enough check? Uh, that's that's always a good idea from a management perspective. But you know, being able to solve your own problems, do your own threat analysis, probably is the better solution. Not just an answer, but a solution. Exactly. Yeah. And to be honest, I, I actually went into uh, education and, and cybersecurity to really, you know, make the world a better place and, and more safe, right? because I've seen over the 20 years, a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, a lot of attack factors. And sadly, also the one we're going to do today as a nice demo, um, 
it's it's still out there, right? Like the SQL injection first discovered in 1988, something like that. And till today, we still have SQL injection issues. Uh, that's quite sad. So I, I would really wish and hope there was a tool like that. Uh, but unfortunately, there isn't. So uh, yeah, here is what we try to do uh, with education, training people, making them aware that we have this uh, capability on, uh, you know, defending your applications, your organizations against attacks. Sounds good. Well, I'm excited. Uh, I, I'll I'll stop talking and, and let you get started with your presentation. All right. Thank you very much. So. Um, like uh, the, the title says, we are going to look into the critical security risk. Um, good thing is we already did a sort of an introductory, so I'm not going to really bore you who I am. <laughs> I just did that, so let's skip. Um, what is important uh, when we talk about the most critical security risk is also knowing who we have against us, right? So who are actually the players of the game? Because honestly, for attackers, it's yeah more sort of a game, right? If you take certain uh, countries, certain areas in the world, you know you're not really that much prosecuted or not at all actually when you play the game of hacking and attacking. Um, so in the good old days, we actually had had the left side, the the guy in the hoodie, the hacker. Um, it could be a black hat hacker. It could be a nation state hacker. It could be a script kitty, uh, somebody who's just getting into the game, uh, using especially a lot of tools, um, but also think of the disgruntled internal threats, right? The employees uh, at the company. So those were the players of the game on the left side. And now we see also on the right side that actually, yeah, displays the automated scripts and tools that actually, you know, automated uh, and automatically search the internet and scans the internet for vulnerabilities. So if you have like servers or web applications that are exposed eh, on the edge, on the internet, these type of bots and scripts will actually go over them, test them, and try to get all the low hanging fruit stuff that actually can leverage into gaining access or stealing information and sensitive information. Um, now, I'm also going to ask some questions. Eh? <laughs> it's quite interesting that I will do that because there's not really a way to, to respond to me. Uh, but I do want you to be engaged in thinking at least. Uh, and the first question I want to ask, like, eh, for example, these, this right side, the automated attacks, like how much time and effort will it take, for example, for a script to scan the whole IPv4 range, eh? so all the IPv4 addresses, that are available and scan one port and get the information like, hey, what is the service? What is the version? All that good stuff. Would it take like months or maybe weeks? I would guess hours now with AI. I mean, AI is, uh, you know, maybe not even hours, but with, with AI, isn't that changing everything? Ah, well, <laughs> Indeed, that is going to be another extra flavor to the game. Uh, but indeed, so if you have like multiple data centers with a very good uplink uh, connection, you can run it in seconds and uh, less than 10 seconds and you scan, boom, the whole IPv4 address space. So this is also highlighting the importance uh, of having proper patching in place, making sure you're using the latest uh, secure libraries making sure you do your configuration of your servers and of the applications that you install correctly, because it is such a fast game uh, that we're playing. And it's, of course, very easy for us as the, uh, you know, the person who wants to defend against the attacks, because, yeah, we only have to miss one point, right? Overlook one important aspect, and we're screwed, basically, right? And the hackers, uh, the players of the game, they have all the time. They can spend as much time and, and poke as, from as many angles as possible. Uh, and even waiting till you're screwing up, right? For example, uh, one company once uh, got hacked. And when they did a, an analysis about it, it turned out that the uh, ops guy wanted to upgrade the firewalls. And they had a redundant firewall set up. And he thought like, well, I can do both of them at the same time. I mean, it takes like, what, 15 minutes? 
Well, guess what? In those 50 minutes, somebody port scanned their servers, found the database service open because the firewall was down, being patched, uh, brute forced the database uh, username, password credentials, got lucky, and dumped the whole database. So it was already quite a challenging game for us. And yeah, unfortunately, it got a bit worse. Yeah. Uh, now, like you mentioned, Tim, uh, with AI into the mix, yeah, things are going to be in a much higher stream, uh, uh, even faster pace than before. Now, that is also going to give more challenges um, uh, to us on, on how to, to correctly deal with this. Uh, it can go very worse, uh, like Skynet, actually. Uh, if you remember the Terminator Skynet, that was actually a cybersecurity AI tool, right? To help and <laughs> protect the world. Uh, but actually, yeah, well, we all seen the Terminator. Um, so the new game, uh, the new player joined the game. Well, uh, the, the sword always has like two sides, right? <laughs> um, so the good side is, for example, here we have a piece of uh, code uh, that actually, uh, as you can see, is written in Node.js. Um, it has a directory, static directory. In there, we have a get request in the application, and we're going to use that value from the get request in the execute command here. And as you can see, it's using the convert command of Linux to, to resize a static image. Now, in this example, uh, and, and this is where security requirements, security training, and awareness is so important, because me as an attacker can leverage this to actually uh, make uh, and perform what we call a command injection. With this, we can take over the whole server and actually now we can run any command on the server that will be executed. Um, uh, and just to mention, of course, on the server, you can have a least privilege of user rights and all that good stuff. But again, this is just a time factor. Uh, we normally say as hackers, when we get access to the machine, it's a matter of time till we escalated our privileges to root, and then we're even better off. Now, the good thing, like you see here, I asked uh, ChatGPT, an older version, uh, to review the code. And what did it say? Hey, you have a big issue there, sir, because actually you have user input directly uh, in the exec that's going to start a child process. And with that, we can actually perform a command injection attack. Awesome. I also ask uh, how to solve this. Well, it continues. Well, you need to uh, validate the user input. And here, indeed, it identified correctly that what we're passing is just an, a value, an integer value. So here we are forcing that what we are getting is only allowed as an integer. So again, we can pass that through at our sanitized input. And now the command injection is not possible anymore. So quite some uh, good stuff about ChatGPT and AI in general, uh, but I must say these are the the, <laughs> the most simple, basic, straightforward uh, input injections that you can have, right? So um, even uh, other type of security scanning tools like a SOS, uh, a static analyzing tool, or a DOS, a dynamic analyzing tool, would normally find these type of vulnerabilities because they are pretty straightforward eh? and the taint analysis is also quite easy. So yeah, it, it is like uh, stealing a, a lolly from a child. Now, the bad side, for example, here, uh, this is actually uh, an example of uh, a, an injection eh? like we saw before. And here I also asked like, okay, so how do I verify? Eh? I'm the owner of this code, I wrote it. so. Yeah, how can I verify this, that it is really a command injection? And indeed, <clears throat> what you see here is that it gave the correct intro. Eh? So it closes with the semicolon, the previous statement. Eh? So you see here, the previous convert resize is now closed. We put our own commands in between, we close it again, and we let the original text continue. So now we're actually going to introduce a second command that will be run with the application that was, of course, not intended by the developer. 
Um, so the bad thing is that ChatGPT just gave us, and this uh, could also be another AI, but gave us the exact command injection uh, to leverage this vulnerability in this application. So technically, you could also do this uh, with open source software, like, hey, please review this part. And it could produce also <laughs> uh, the, the attack. Now, here, another example of one of the uh, uh, labs in the security knowledge framework. That is what we call a local file inclusion vulnerability. And it's mostly when you're dealing with files and resources, getting them, downloading them, writing them, everything that's like a file name, basically. Um, and where we can manipulate the location and the file, what is being loaded by the application. Yeah, because there's no validation, for example, on the file names that are uh, presented by the user to the uh, backend server, or yeah, the restriction is not set correctly. <laughs> so here we see that I took one of the requests from the browser uh, using uh, Firefox and um, the debug option. I copied the curl request and I said, well, maybe here is a, I think there's a path reversal vulnerability. So how can I test this actually through? Um, and it gave me a nice response saying, well, you know, you can use the dot dot slash sequence uh, to traverse back to another folder on your root system. Um, but you can also have a Windows machine. So you need to not do the dot dot forward slash, but actually the dot dot backslash uh, because that uses a different uh, traversal technique. And um, then it also mentioned like uh, the URL encoding, for example, for the dot dot slash. So maybe uh, the developer had some prevention, uh, meaning uh, you would scan for the input for dot dot slash and then reject the user input when it will find this deny list based value. Uh, by converting it then to a URL encoding, uh, like you see here, well, it's, it's now not dot dot slash anymore. So it will bypass uh, the validation. Here you see uh, number four, uh, a zero byte, a no byte injection. So that's for like PHP applications. And I must say also an old version of PHP. If you inject something like that on PHP level, it will read past the no byte, but actually on the C library implementation of the file function in PHP, it will actually stop when it will see the no byte because it's C. So there you can also use it to bypass all these nice extension check or file name checks or all that good stuff. So you see actually that, what, at least from myself, eh, from an experienced hacker point of view, it gave really awesome results in terms of eh, how you can actually bypass certain eh, path traversal protection mechanisms, uh, which are all sort of uh, a denialist based. So that is also wrong. We will go a bit more in depth about that in a bit. Um, but as you see, it really gives you very detailed information and here you can actually see it created a new curl request with the proper first you know, injection to test. So yeah, why is this so important? Eh? Because we see that AI and the old players of the game, eh, it is like very exciting stuff actually. Eh? I mean, I'm now 20 years uh, in, in the industry um, and this is something really exciting and new. And I would say sort of like a revolution, uh, how this AI and all these capabilities are now used for good, but also for bad. And also when you think of uh, that everything is even more connected in the world than ever, that yeah, the pressing, you know, um, how, how you say it, how, how most important it will be now to actually do security and make it a top priority, right? At least to, try and implement and grow in your security posture. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, why does it even matter? Well, protecting sensitive data, safeguarding the business continuity, defending against cyber threats and, you know, um, things can go really bad, for example, right? Take, you know, in the Netherlands, we have, uh, well, like half of the Netherlands for people who don't know is basically below seawater. And we have all these nice dikes that you know keeps the water out of the Netherlands. Uh, but guess what? The machine, the computer that regulates the dikes and you know open the gates, closing them, they were actually connected to the edge, to the public internet. 
and nobody did proper security assessments on it. Nobody uh, did the patching. And it turned out that this actually was vulnerable and could be taken over by an adversary and just, you know, open the dikes. So imagine uh, what that would have as an impact, right, in a country, right, like the Netherlands. So we all do understand why cybersecurity, of course, matters, right? It is about lives, it's about data, it's about safeguarding business continuity. And what is also very key, paramount to realize is that uh, when we look at the yeah, trajectory of the coming years in terms of cybercrime, you see that it's like we're talking here about trillions, right? So 2027, 23, let's say 24 trillion US dollar worldwide in, in damages. And this is only the part that we actually see, right? Because honestly, who has a proper monitoring system in place? Who actually knows when a you know a hacker or disgruntled employee steals sensitive data or makes backups and you know sends it to uh, to itself or to somebody else? So this is only the observable part, actually, right? That we see here the figures of. Um, yeah, and of course, there's yeah real world impact just like i mentioned that with the story of the netherlands and the dikes similar for other you know examples like the healthcare giant uh, where that got hit by ransomware uh, the backdoor that targets us uh, uh, organizations and as you can see also here uh, uh, this is the top 10 data breaches uh, of 2023 that yeah only in the uk it's gigantic, the amount of records that were breached, right? And it's not only that one. This list continues. It's just insane. And, you know, you would also argue like, yeah, so what is actually, you know, a data record worth? Why are people dumping those databases, right? Well, actually, like, if you have a proper record, like first name, last name, address, phone, maybe even a bank account, email, stuff like that, it can go between like five or $15 each. It really depends on how enriched the data record is. Because of course, with that, we can actually, I don't know, maybe get loans or, you know, uh, impersonate somebody else, um, stuff like that. So there's money to be made with the, those data records, right? Well, you're kind of freaking me out here, Glenn. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's uh, you're, you're, is anything safe? I guess is is really the question. <laughs> well, okay. So, if uh, anything, the thing is, you know, with security and also with you know cryptography, encryption, hashing, it's all based on time, actually, right? And that's the thing, you can add something, making something 100% secure, no. So, you know, honestly, I would say as a black and white answer, indeed, nothing is really secure uh, because it's all a time-based factor, just like uh, encryption that will say, this is secure in terms of uh, this algorithm of encryption you're using because it will take X amount of time of the sun dying and creating and yada yada uh, to be able to get like a collision or et, et cetera. But indeed, the, there is a lot you can do to make it as hard as possible for attackers. Uh, and that also brings to uh, the, the example we are going to do, the demo, for example, where we go and illustrate about input validation and why, uh, what are the secure design principles of input validation and why you should do that. Because also there at input validation, you have monitoring and logging. And if you set that up correctly in your application, then that information can also be feeded into your SIEM, right? your security event uh, information event monitoring system. So enriching the data that you already got from your network appliances, from your web server, et cetera, to get a better view of when you will be hacked, right? We always used to say like, yeah, there's the question if you get hacked, but nowadays, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. You will be hacked and you need to be ready. You need to at least have good monitoring and logging. So when it happens, you can act immediately, right? 
And yeah, with the whole growing technology stacks, it's even more crucial that you have that visibility, right? That monitoring capabilities, and not only from an appliance point of view, but also from your application point of view. Um, and again, we can use uh, security tooling like the SAS, DOS, software component analysis, yeah, finding vulnerable libraries, all that good stuff, using security requirements yeah, before we develop code. We can do verification yeah, of the implementation of those requirements by performing pen tests, code audits. So yeah, you can do a lot and make it very hard you know, for attackers to actually uh, uh, take over or infiltrate in your organization. Um, but it is it is possible to do, right? So that, that's the good story about it. <laughs> it's not impossible, but we can make it very hard. And that is, you know, what they say, right? The 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 most annoying quote in cybersecurity, which always makes me cry, and that is they say security is a layered approach like an onion. <laughs> so yeah. That is what we can do, building layer on layer on layer and make it as hard as possible. Um, yeah, and you know, also when we talk about that layered uh, approach, uh, we all have the shared responsibilities, like all the employees play a role, right? If one employee doesn't follow uh, the, the security requirements and the method of uh, building secure software, of course, that can be the stepping stone into your you know, organization or critical assets that then can still be, be owned, right? And the collaboration between IT and non-IT staff is also key important because normally what I see that IT people do understand the need for uh, cybersecurity and security awareness and security tooling, but the non-IT staff is like, yeah, but look, I wanna release quickly. Eh? Why is this stopping me? Go, go, go. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, you need to do security, but do it as quick as possible. Um, and I just, you know, from an experience point of view, want to say, yeah, maybe it's good when you are in this situation as a developer and you do want to yeah, build cybersecurity properly in, you know, have a look at quality, you know, quality in general of the software and the applications you develop. Because if you look and you know think quality is important, like you know uptime, uh, maintainability of code, security, end-to-end -end testing, right? All those things are basically facets of the quality uh, that you're going to deliver with your software that you're uh, going to release. So that would be a good question to ask non-IT staff, the managers, the hiring managers. Like, okay, what are the criteria for the quality? Uh, in the different aspects that we need to comply to. And security fits there very nicely in, and it gives you a good base to actually start from and also get expectations clear, right? Um, yeah, and the last one, of course, cybersecurity as a strategic business priority. Uh, I see now even secure or like coding companies that say, look, we are awesome because cybersecurity and secure development is prioritized number one. Yes, it will take a bit more time, but our stuff that we build is awesome, right? It will keep the attackers outside. So I think that's also an interesting uh, angle, actually, that's now developing in our industry. Makes sense. Um, yeah, then, yeah, of course, uh, understanding cyber threats. Um, like we said a bit uh, before, uh, we have a lot of... Um, you know, input validation and input injections, misconfiguration, uh, missing patches, uh, all that good stuff. But what we also see and realize, if you take, for example, all, and now I focus a little bit of, on web application vulnerabilities, the rule of thumb is that 50% of all the possible vulnerabilities in a web application landscape it's all related to input injections, misconfiguration, authorization, authentication, bypass, stuff like that. And the other 50% is actually related to business logic vulnerabilities. Now, here you see a lot of um, yeah, impact and issues because business logic vulnerabilities, you cannot find those with any security tooling. 
So let's say you're only using security tooling, eh? the code scanner, the dynamic scanner, the software component analysis, and you do that, you think we are rocking it, we're doing security. Then actually, from a technical point, you're only finding 50%, potentially 50%. Why do I say potentially? Because those scanning tools cannot find all of the vulnerabilities at yeah, that 50%. So technically it's only 20% they can find. So there's still 80%, right? A gap that you need to address yourself. And for example, for the business logic vulnerabilities, you can only cover that by manual face-to-face -face dialogues uh, and doing proper threat modeling, for example. So only with threat modeling, you can identify the business logic vulnerabilities. And to, to give you an example, you have in a web application sometimes an identifier that is used to fetch maybe a resource or a document. If you change that identifier and you increase it with one, maybe you get somebody else document, right? So that is what we call an IDOR in, in web application vulnerability landscape. Now, there's no tool who can identify and say, ah, if I increase this number, I see something different. So it's in the vulnerability. It cannot because it doesn't have the context that actually what was presented in the first page, uh, ID number 88, and the second page, ID number 89, uh, that actually belongs to a different person, right? So this is a simple example of uh, a business logic vulnerability. But of course, there are, you know, way more advanced things, right? Like uh, take, for example, the Pirate Bay. The Pirate Bay, back in the day, and now I'm talking about 2009, they were sued and they were not so happy. There are big lawyers on their neck um, and they wanted to do something against the lawyer. So they looked at the business policies, uh, how they operate, which bank they were using, and they found out that they got like a thousand free transactions at that bank uh, per month. And for every additional uh, thousand number one, they needed to pay $1 transaction fees. So business logic vulnerability, sort of, right? Abusing business logic and the process. What did the Pirate Bay do? They asked the whole community, and well, Pirate Bay has a big community, asked to donate $1 to that bank account. And now uh, the first thousand were free. And for all the others, uh, actually, no, one cent, sorry. They asked to transfer one cent so they paid 99 cents. Yes, that was the case. So this is a more advanced uh, example of a business uh, logic and a business process uh, that could be abused by an, uh, an attacker. Uh, but yeah, the only way to do this properly is uh, doing threat modeling and those type of things. Now, what I mentioned before, it needs to be a layered approach, right? So you have security requirements, you have security tooling, you have penetration testing, you have threat modeling, you have all these different yeah, phases right, in your release cycle to actually counter and have a high coverage eh, of being as secure as possible. Good question time, and I, I think we'll have a poll here coming soon as well. Um, so while people are looking at that poll and and figuring it out, I have some questions that I've been kind of holding on to, <clears throat> and I'll pass along. Uh, one of which is, I mean, I know the answer, but I'd like yours, uh, is code audit treated the same as penetration testing, and how often is it a good practice to do for that code base? Um, that's an excellent question. So what I would say is normally what I believe is the developers with the right training awareness yeah, about secure coding, about security, will do a way better job than actually doing a penetration test. Um, because a penetration test is done by a hacker. Hopefully you get a very good one. It could also be yeah, a not so good one that just use some tools and uh, that's it. Um, and they lack a lot of context, right? I mean, you're the developer, you build parts of that code base. 
So you know this application inside out. Now, what is going to be key important is the structure and the approach, how you do it, right? So if you use like a good security requirement document uh, that covers all the different topics and per topic, you go into your application and check them off. Like, yes, I do proper session management because I set the HTTP only flag, the secure flag, you know, all those things you check and you verify your code base, then you will get a way more in-depth coverage than just doing a penetration test. Even if you would give the penetration tester uh, the source code, even then you empower it with knowledge about secure coding, security requirements, uh, and having that correct approach will outshine you know, any, any pen test. Now, the other question about how much and how often should you do it? Well, I would say the first time uh, you, you build the application, hopefully you already use security requirements so you can take those as non-functional requirements into the sprint and your scope that you're uh, building your application, your project. And then actually, after you completed the first milestone or the MVP, you apply on the whole code base all the requirements that are applicable. Now, after this one, you would actually only focus on the incremental parts, right? So you built, you released the project for the first time, you did the whole swoop swoop. Now with the next releases, you're only going to look at the diff, like, oh, I'm going to build here a new function, I don't know, a file upload. And again, you're going just to check the requirements and verify the implementation of the requirements for that diff eh, are done in a correct way. So the first time it's a bit, you know, a lot because you really have to go over, check all the boxes and verify the implementation. But after that, when you're really in a sprint flow, adding new features, tiny bits, and then you only focus on those diffs. So basically always, all the time. <laughs> uh, but the first one is, you know, a bit heavier, but after that, you just have small reviews. It's basically like you already do a sort of code review anyway. Yeah? But now with a security mindset, using a structured approach actually uh, to, to verify the implementation from a security point of view. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I, I know that the poll has uh, been completed and so there's some, some results popping up here. So uh, looks like layered response uh, is fairly split. So 28% uh, no, partially 36. I thought that'd be higher myself, honestly. Uh, 16 for some places and only 21 say organizational wide. So I, I thought partially would be like three quarters of them, but uh, you know, that it may be the, the organizations I tend to work with uh, as distinct from the industry wide. Uh, so that's, appreciate that. The, the next question that we have actually leads into your next topic, which is what are the most common security risks that developers overlook uh, how do you proactively address them? Basically, how do we keep ourselves as secure as we can be? That, I'm adding that last little bit myself, but what are the common risks that are overlooked with web apps? Well, like I mentioned, it's mostly input, input injection type of vulnerabilities and the business logic. Yeah? So those two are mostly the most common and the biggest risk. And yeah, again, uh, to really counter this, use security requirements uh, there are good frameworks and, and standards out there that can really give you that structural approach uh, and to do that correctly um, but that is indeed uh, the most important ones and especially if we look uh, at, to the next slides for example uh, the OWASP top 10 probably you all heard of it well here is the top 10 risk now don't you know, um, just a highlight, make sure that you're not doing only the top 10, right? The standard and ver verification standards and frameworks I use are normally around 190 something requirements. So if you do the top 10, cool, 10 of those will be striped off with the other 170 are still attack factors uh, and possible entries into your application. So these yeah, were the top 10 from 2017 and they reassessed and said, well, 2021, this is the new top 10. And they did a survey, right? At companies like, okay, please uh, tell us how did you get owned? Was very anonymized. So <laughs> uh, 
but yeah, so these are the top 10. Uh, but again, it goes way deeper than this, right? Now, I also want to briefly talk about what I think is, uh, especially when we talk about input injections, what are the best secure coding practices? So here, for example, uh, input validation, I think this is the most overlooked, super important defense uh, that you can have, defensive layer to your application. Because when you're developing, you need to have the mindset of how do I make it work, but I minimize the attack surface. How can you minimize attack surface? As similar, like you have a computer organization network, what do you do? You have VPN. Why do we use VPN? Same stuff, minimizing the attack service, right? And that is what we also want to achieve with input validation. Now, it's not that you only do input validation. It's the first layer of defense, right? Take SQL injection. How do you solve and prevent SQL injections? Using parameterized queries. But I will still do input validation. Right, that's my first layer, and the real design pattern is actually parameterized queries. Um, so, like I said, uh, input validation is really the gatekeeper. Uh, think about the user input that you get from the search, from the username, all the forms a person can fill in, uh, but also the operating system resources or external resource or, or external communication uh, with other APIs. Um, yeah, and basically user input. What is then user input? Well, parameters, cookie, heady, headers, body content. So basically everything in the HTTP protocol, right? Everything can be adjusted, spoofed, changed. And that also brings me to the next slide. Uh, the client side, we do also what I see there, we do also input validation, but please be aware this is in the browser of the hacker, right? So it is great for helping, you know, guiding users yeah, that, that use your application. But the server side is really only the effective layer. And also a rule of thumb is that input need always to, needs to be rejected if it's not correct. Uh, and what we want to achieve again, prevent malformed data as an input into our application. The more stuff we can push out, already from this get-go, uh, from the start, by doing proper input validation, will actually make the whole flow of the application and the data that goes to all the functions way smoother and secure. Um, of course, uh, when you also do comparisons of data and data types, you need to make sure that you normalize uh, and, and pick a strategy. For example, everything to lowercase and then compare but we do store the original format that we got in the database, right? We're not going to alter and then store because that can also introduce later on different type of vulnerabilities. Um, just to highlight here, data structures so or object states, be super careful, you know, like serialized objects or stuff like that. You know, you need to be very strict, use schema validation where possible. Uh, and again, also here, input validation is important. Now, when we look at the three major coding principles is actually the input whitelisting, the length checking, and type checking. And these input validation rules can really save you even if you have a boo-boo. Uh, let's say I make an SQL query, I forgot to do the uh, parameterized queries, with proper input whitelisting, length checking, and type checking, there's a high probability that yes, it is vulnerable, but it's not exploitable, right? And this is exactly what I said. We wanna minimize the attack service as much as possible. And with these three principles, we actually can do that. And so an allow list, of course, here I have an href. I only want these two results into it, uh, websites. So a switch statement, an if else. What I like about this one is that it has a safety default fallback mechanism inside. Uh, so even it can catch weird exceptions, right? Because there's a default. So that could be in, a, in an allow list. Um, of course, the input length, when I talk about a page ID, well, and I only have three or four pages, I can set it on three or five or 10. 
uh, like realistically with a bit of extra to restrict the length of the parameter. Um, and of course, well, and again, if it's a page ID, I only say it, it's only allowed an integer as a type. Um, now, also for thread modeling, eh? uh, like I said, why is it so important? Because business logic, you can only find it by doing thread modeling, doing code reviews. And like this example, what will be true? We have an X and a Y, both are 10, sort of. Now, here is your critical business logic that will ask or check if you have superpowers as a user, for example, right? Or not, right? If else, if this, do that. If this user has this authorization, do that. Now, eh, what will be true? The first one, the second one. Yeah, who knows? There's no comments, right? So we have no idea what is happening here. And this is like a great example where business logic vulnerabilities will creep in, right? Well, for the people who really want to know, although it is PHP, eh? <laughs> Uh, the first one will be true, the second one will be false because the three equal signs actually checks the type as well, right? So in there's different types, so this one will be false and this if statement will be true. Looks like we have uh, time for, for more questions here and uh, another poll that should pop up. So while people are filling out the poll, um, wide range of questions. One is, what was the game you were playing when you realized uh, that someone was using aimbot? That was the good old best game of all, fast-paced game, Unreal Tournament 99. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, we have we've had some pretty complex questions, so people are definitely leaning into uh, this, but. Uh, and I think you're going to touch on this, but uh, talking about best practices uh, for securing APIs, authentication, authorization, so forth. Are you going to touch on some of the best practices or how to keep up with the fast changing world of cybersecurity? Huh. I would say not not in this talk, um, but I do have other material where we go and like like threat modeling, for example, you can get so much out of it, but that's like a whole course topic on its own, right? And just like a, a proper DevOps pipeline and secure coding principles, they are like, yeah, sort of, uh, they, they deserve their own uh, block and, and explanation because, you know, it's just about that, right? Having the, the different phases of your release cycle and your uh, capabilities aligned and applying them and do that in a structural way that really keeps you up in the game. Sounds good, sounds good. Well, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So uh, I know we still have a few slides to grind, but you, you're, you know, it's really you that we're listening to. So, you know, uh, we'll wait for the, the poll to finish, talk about those results real quick, uh, and then uh, continue along. Looks like uh, investment in threat modeling. No, 49%. That's that I expected. That I figure was about half have not even probably even heard of threat modeling. 30% uh, started. Good, good to hear. 14% embedded in the culture. Love to hear that. That's exactly. that's yeah. uh that's good. Especially, yeah, especially yeah, with, with software and web application development. I mean, 50% of the vulnerabilities and how you can lose your data or gain access or abuse processes you can only cover with threat modeling. So, and that's a huge chunk, honestly, right? Good thing we have a course in that, huh? Yes, true that. Um, now, just uh, very quickly, a couple of things you don't wanna do um, that will make you cry in a corner. Like I also have cried in a corner because I did that. You know, um, basically the, yeah, the deny list approach, for example, here, input, uh, we're going to black deny list, all the different options, their variants, but, you know, like uh, Mr. Thomas and Edison said, uh, you think you have exhausted all the possibilities, but you haven't. Here, I have a sneaky one where I put a space in front of the HTTP. Uh, so how do you circumvent it? HTTP uh, space in front of it. Now it's space HTTP, so it doesn't conform again anymore to the deny list, and now you bypassed it. Uh, regular expression, awesome, but also here be careful uh, because here we allow only secure by the design, 
how did we get faucet using a question mark and then just put the add the string somewhere so we actually can just sail by. Uh, again, unexpected user input should always lead to rejection. Very important. Otherwise, you can introduce new vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities that were not possible, but because you're trying to modify the data of the user. Yeah? So don't do that. If you get something, it's not what you expected. Oop, reject, try again, give good data. Um, now I wanted to do a quick demo and actually do an SQL injection lab um, to show you uh, how an attacker would abuse this. It will go fasting, lightning, super speed, um, you know, <laughs> just to show you. And then we want, I want to reference back to the secure coding prim principles to show you like this could have, you know, prevented it, right? So let's do uh, a little lab here. Oof, all righty. So here we have an application. The application is quite boring. Uh, you have three menu options, and when I click them, the data here is changing. Now, of course, what an attacker would try to do is create like that uh, input in the URL that would trigger hopefully some type of error. So here we can see that worked. We have an SQLite 3 error. So SQLite 3 is a very simple database actually. And it will say now, hey, you have an error in your query. Here, because the developer was so kind, he enabled debug mode. So we actually see the whole query here. And we can also see over here, the username is actually concatenated uh, directly into the query. So with a bit of magic and fool, we can now alter the logic of this SQL query and actually do an SQL injection. So I will just do, and one is one. Uh, so I changed the logic and said uh, uh, this value and one is equals to one. Awesome. So it gives back the site. If I do two, it will become false. So it gives an error. So with this, I verified there is actually a proper SQL injection. So union select one, it will say not enough columns. So I increase the amount of columns that I will join and select, boom. Now it's good. There's no error anymore. I now going to select from a table. So table foo doesn't exist. Okay. Now, does the user's table exist? Yes, there's no error. Perfect. Now in the user's table, what type of columns do we have there? Probably uh, there is a username. Yes, there is. We now see that uh, the one is replaced with admin. Awesome. Now we go to passwords, and there we go. So I abused this uh, application and the query that was vulnerable, altered the logic, right, using the union select, and actually retrieved the password hash of the admin user from the database. Now, just to wrap up and also explain a bit uh, how it would be. So we have here, the whitelist, whitelist approach, type check, and the length. So normally you would say the length, plebeian, uh, let's say the names would be 15. The type is a string uh, in this case, and the whitelist, what do we expect? A to Z, uppercase lower, A to Z lower, and maybe zero to nine. Let's, let's be fancy, right? So that would be my regular expression whitelist of the characters, characters I would expect. So everything that's not this, I would reject this user input. Now here is the full SQL injection. So let me just copy this one. Now, as you can see, the whitelist, if I would have applied this input validation, right? You will see here, error, here, error. Here, error, and here, error, right? So we have multiple characters that were needed for the exploit to actually work, and they're not in the whitelist, and still not. Even if I would say I have Irish people in the name uh, in, in my application, okay, this one goes, uh, but still we have many others that would still be an issue to work for the, for the exploit. Of course, the type a string, this is a string, 
Now the length, that is also an interesting one. So this is 15. You see how tiny little space you have. And even if you would do, uh, make it bigger, like 40 characters, you see that I still need more uh, to actually create a, a, a proper exploit. So input validation, doing that properly, setting a whitelist regular expression, setting the length and the type, checking it, really can prevent a lot of these, yeah, potential uh, abuse case, right? Yeah, it's the first layer of defense, but to do it properly, SQL and prevention using parameterized queries. But you see, if you do forget it somewhere and you structurally apply input validation uh, in your whole application, then this might save you. You have a vulnerable piece of code, but it's not exploitable. So I think that is also quite important to understand the power of input validation and minimizing that attack surface, right? So to sort of wrap up, wrap up a bit, uh, so what will now give you the best bang for buck? Start with security requirements before you develop. Be already aware of the potential security aspects you need to implement uh, in your features. Then of course, security testing and validation by code reviewing, right? That uh, a gentleman just said of those requirements. And again, what I've seen over the past 20 years, training the developers in secure coding and practices uh, like threat modeling, uh, all those good things, because you need to empower the developers. Uh, like I said, to identify and prevent those vulnerabilities from the start, which really reduce the cost uh, of the fixes, project being released on time and breaches down the line. So I think uh, I try to put everything in, the most important topics and risk. Uh, I really hope uh, you had some uh, very inspirational moments. Sounds good. Well done. Well done, Glenn. Um, and, you know, here we see a 30% uh, off code that you can use uh, to take some of our training. Uh, and then even uh, meet Glenn. So Glenn offers some of the uh, instructor-led content that we do. We do workshops. Uh, we have e-learning as well. Uh, when you saw uh, Glenn typing and going through one of the exercises of the SQL injection, uh, those are, are things that we have in some of our e-learning classes. So you get to see uh, more of that if you take some of our training. And here's 30% off. So uh, thanks for, for definitely being here. We do have some other questions that have, have come through. Uh, so while we have a few minutes, let's just take a couple minutes and answer them. Uh, so um, I guess that threat modeling is something that lets organizations prevent the business logic vulnerabilities, right? Yes, it's uh, basically identifying where in the process, you know, business process, but also in that, because normally what happens, the business has a process that's being converted or integrated into an application, right? And yeah, there you want to, using threat modeling, define abuse scenarios, find potential uh, attack scenarios. And then, yeah, it's really like, hey, but wait, we have a wizard, right? And what happens if the person goes from step one actually to the end of the wizard? right? Do we actually validate something in between that the person went through all the steps so it is really, like I said, it, to do a proper threat modeling, you do need some tools and some uh, guidance and approaches, but um, this is your best chance to actually, add with threat modeling, identify those business logic vulnerabilities. Because like I mentioned, there are no tools in the market that will do this in an automated way at looking the code or scanning your application that, that doesn't exist, yeah. Okay, okay, so threat modeling seems to be a common uh, idea, keeping track, uh, that's another question, you know, various resources to keep track. Of course, our training is what I would always look at, uh, but other than um, uh, that, what are other ways that I can keep track of these security threats? Um, well, of course, I would say what, what I see that most people really struggle with 
um, I mean, you have a lot of tools and the tools are being updated by the vendors, right? And they keep mostly track of uh, new ways, new vulnerabilities. You know, normally when log for shell or something happens, the whole internet is, you know, alarming you about it. But I think the more uh, critical one is actually how do you keep track of your own vulnerabilities in your own organization? Uh, because using all those tools, producing all these type of vulnerabilities uh, and listings that you need to counter, fix, patch, uh, and so on. I think that's even a bigger challenge because um, you need to have a proper vulnerability management system. That's basically what it comes down on, uh, where you can say, ah, this is a, a good one. This is a false positive. That's actually a wrong assumption by the tool or, uh, and, and, be able to prioritize from all the results that you get from all the different security tools, prioritize the ones that are really burning and you should fix ASAP and then also keeping track of it, right? So. Okay, no, that's perfect. Thank you, uh, Glenn. Well, thank you for your time today, Glenn. Thank you for everybody attending and participating with us. Uh, we appreciate your questions. Uh, Again, take, a, take advantage of that 30% off code and, and we definitely hope to see you in some of our webinars and courses and other opportunities in the future. I'll, uh, I'll hand the ma uh, mic back over to the Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Glenn and Tim, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.